now that you've had a chance to take a look at how to actually program the fork join pool with a couple of different models, we're going to talk about another important capability to understand, which is something called the common fork join pool. You'll recall that all the things we just looked at each had their own individual fork join pools that we allocated specifically, but there's also something called the common fork join pool. And for many programs, in fact, arguably for all programs, depending on how you believe the Java uh, architects and the Java documentation, they actually recommend you don't allocate your own specific unique thread, uh, fork join pool, but instead use a common pool. And this is what's known as the static pool, and you'll see why it's called that in a second. And it's, it's appropriate for most programs. If you want to use the fork join pool, or if you use the parallel streams framework by default, you'll end up using this common pool. And so all the, all the programs in a process that use the common pool will have all of their tasks running in a single pool of threads. So think of it like this you know, gigantic pool where everybody's running in there and, uh, and processing. Why this is a win, potentially, is because the common pool knows about how all the resources in that process are being used. And so it can try to do a better job of globally managing processor resources because there's a single pool that contains everything. In particular, it makes it a lot easier to keep the threads in the worker thread pool busy because it's got lots more work to, to chug away on. Whereas if you have your each your own little idiosyncratic individual pools, then it's hard to get that global view. Um, there are lots of other places that you'll see this trade-off between local versus global resource management in Java. And a good example is the Java heap, which is used for allocating memory dynamically and which is managed by the garbage collector. In Java, you're discouraged from having you know, individual uh, idiosyncratic free stores or um, ways of allocating memory for certain object types, but instead you are encouraged to use the global heap. Same idea. You want one global way to keep track of all that stuff. This pool is also used by the Java 8 Parallel Stream framework. So when we talk about Parallel Streams later in the course, you'll see that a Parallel Stream, if there are multiple Parallel Streams in a process, they all share the same common pool. By default, the common fork join pool has one less thread than the number of cores that the virtual machine on that system knows about. So here's what it looks like if you were to take a look inside the make common pool method. You would see that the implementation says runtime dot get runtime dot available processors, which returns eight on my quad core hyperthreaded processor, minus one. So it takes the number of processors and it subtracts one from it. And that's the size of the common fork join pool. Why the heck does it do that, you may ask? Um, <clears throat> in particular, you know, if you go to the common fork join pool and say, how big is it? It'll give you seven if there's eight cores. Why does it do that? And the reason it does that is that it uses the main thread or the invoking thread, better word is not the main thread, the better word is the invoking thread, which is often the main thread, but it doesn't have to be. The invoking thread is also included in the set of threads that run computations when you use the, fork, the common fork join pool. So it's going to be number of cores minus one, that's how big the pool is, and then whoever the invoking thread is, that thread is borrowed to also be part of the computation. So in essence, it actually is able to use all the cores on the machine. But the pool always has one less than the total, because the calling thread or the invoking thread or whatever can be used. It will be used also as part of this. There are situations, however, where the default number of threads in the common fork join pool may not be adequate. Uh, and here's some examples. So let's assume for sake of argument we have, I don't know, four cores, but we want to download 10 images. If we're not careful, and if you really want to laugh, that's, that's what I looked like when I was in college. So. Mullets were really popular back in uh, the early 80s. Um, so basically, 
if you have more work to do than you have threads in your pool, then potentially bad things could happen. One thing is you might just underutilize the processor cores. I'll explain that in a second. That's just going to slow things down more than it should. The other thing you could end up with is, is some kind of deadlock. Let's talk about underutilization, however. Let's say I want to download 10 images, but my common pool only has four threads. Why is that a problem? What's the, what's the downside with, with only having, with having a maximum of four threads if I'm trying to download n images where n is bigger than four. And let's assume for sake of argument the images are big, so it takes a while to download. Yeah. Well, so what will happen, let's say that there's only four threads or four cores um, and ten things to download four things will start downloading, and they will block. Those threads will block. What happens when a thread blocks on I.O.? So for those of you who didn't, haven't taken the operating systems course or don't remember the topic in the operating systems course, or if the operating systems course didn't discuss this with enough detail, when a thread blocks, what can really happen is that thread could be put to sleep, but then the processor can go off and, or the core can go off and do other things. So if there are other threads available, then that core can go and run them, right? There's other threads in the queue that have stuff to do, like download other images. Then that core could put the blocking thread to sleep and then pick another thread and have it go and do something. So for blocking I.O. especially, we'd like to have as many threads as there, you know, not as many threads, but it's often the case you want to have more threads or as many threads as a reasonably sized number of things to do. Because that way, while some threads are blocked on I.O., other threads can be downloading also and blocking. But, you know, eventually if everything's blocked, you're, you're just blocked. But you can start other downloads in parallel with ones that are blocked waiting for the input to finish. So you can get higher utilization and thus more work done per unit time. Um, so you know, just thinking about this kind of intuitively, so if you have, um, let's say you have a bunch of people who are trying to clean up plates at a uh, banquet, right? So you have you know, 50 tables or 100 tables, let's say it's a big event or a wedding or something like that, big wedding. The more people who can be helping the more quickly you'll get done, right? So think about each person, each worker as like a thread. If you only have four people to clean everything up, you know, they'll be doing a lot of work, but the more people who can come along to help out, the faster you get things done. So the same thing is true here. You don't want to have your threads blocked, not being able to have anything else do work. So as a result, the common thread pool can actually be expanded and contracted programmatically. You can make it get bigger or smaller. And there's two typical ways to do this. One way to do this is by modifying a system property. So you can actually come along and change a system property, which is a bit of a mouthful. It's called java.util.concurrent.forkjoinpool.common.parallelism. You can set that system property to some value, which might be the number of concurrent operations or number of parallel operations you want to have threads available to do the work. So let's say we had, you know, 10 images we wanted to download. We knew that. We could set the number of threads to 10. We call this call, and now we've got 10 threads in our pool. The problem, of course, is it's kind of hard to estimate how many threads you need. It's easy if you know 10, but if you have n, where n may change over time, it's kind of hard to know exactly what the right number is. The other thing that makes this hard is that modifying this property affects all the fork join usage in the process. So if you were to set this thing to 10, then everybody would suddenly have 10. If you set it to 2, everybody would suddenly have 2. So it's kind of a coarse grain knob to turn, and it has ripple effects that influence other things. 
So in a big program where different parts were written by different people, they don't all know exactly what the right number should be, as they might clobber each other. Therefore, it might be useful, and it's often necessary, to be able to automatically increase the size of the fork join pool, so you don't kind of hard code it to one number. In order to do that, you have to use something called a managed blocker. And we probably won't have time to talk about managed blocker in detail, uh, but I'll give you a hint about what it's about. So managed blocker is an interface that's defined in Java. It's actually part of the fork join pool class, so managed blocker is an interface defined in a nested manner inside a fork join pool. And it's used to allow things to increase automatically. And what it'll do is it'll temporarily add new worker threads to the common fork join pool, thereby ensuring it doesn't block. And it's particularly useful, as we just talked about, for systems where the operations you write will block on I.O. or on other synchronizers. So they'll be blocked for some period of time. Again, like the image downloading example we just talked about. You can only use managed blockers with the common fork join pool. And they're meant to expand and contract it programmatically. The next part of this lesson will show an example. We won't, probably won't have time to cover that today. The other thing to notice here is that the fork join pool is going to reclaim threads during periods of non-use. So if you go through a bursty period where you have lots of threads that are um, allocated, then it'll increase the size of the pool, but then later, after those threads are not used, it'll automatically shrink it back to the default size, which is typically the number of cores on the machine. So it basically will you know, reap them, and then it can also, of course, reinstate them later in sort of like this reincarnation-like model as needed. So that's the common fork join pool. The, the thing to remember about the common fork join pool is that it's really meant to be you. It's really what you should be using most of the time because it gives the gives the Java scheduler, the fork join pool scheduler, a global perspective on the amount of work that needs to be done, thereby making it possible to keep all the queues and the threads as active as possible, which as we talked about before is the whole goal of parallelism, make things run and maximize parallel computations. Because of the fact that you sometimes need more than just the default number of cores, the fork join pool size can be expanded and contracted programmatically either by modifying a global system property or by using managed blockers. So that wraps up this discussion. Next time we will talk about how the uh, fork join pool managed blocker interface actually works.